What was the importance of Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch trial? The 1924 trial of German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945, and nine other men. Charged with treason for their attempted coup, in German, Putsch. Of late 1923, marked the beginning of Hitler's seemingly unstoppable rise to power. As the leader of the Nazi Party, National Socialists German Workers' Party. Hitler had gained enough of a following to believe that on the night of November 8, 1923, as Bavarian leader Gustav von Kahr spoke in a Munich beer hall. Hitler and his followers all of them determined to recreate a powerful German Empire and rid it of its mongrel-like quality could topple the weak German government. Merely by demonstrating that the Nazis, and not the official government, had gained the support of the people. But in a march through Munich the following day, the still loyal Germany regular army and the Bavarian state police opened fire on the Nazi demonstrators and their sympathizers. Killing 16 and arresting Hitler and his nine co-conspirators. Their trial began on February 26, 1924, over the course of 25 days. Aided by radio and newspaper coverage, Hitler held forth, in one case taking four hours to respond to a single question. Earning him the overwhelming support of the German people. His impassioned appeals turned what ought to have been open and closed. Case of treason against him into an indictment of the German government. His basic argument was this, I cannot declare myself guilty. True, I confess to the deed, but I do not confess to the crime of high treason. There can be no question in an action which aims to undo the betrayal of this country. In 1918, Hitler was referring to the German surrender in World War I, 1914-18. Nevertheless, he and nine others were convicted of treason. Hitler was sentenced to five years in prison. Where he wrote the first volume of his infamous work Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Which revealed his frightening theories of racial supremacy and his belief in the Third Reich. Released after only nine months. Hitler walked out of prison more popular than he had been before his highly publicized trial. What was trial by battle? Like trial by ordeal. Trial by battle was a method of justice used predominantly during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. When noblemen had disputes, they would engage in a duel with one other. The assumption was that the person who was in the right would have God on his side. And he would emerge the victor in combat. No questions asked. This form of trial was gradually replaced by trial by jury. When was the Office of Homeland Security formed? The Office of Homeland Security was organized in the days following the September 11, 2001, 
terrorist attacks. President George W. Bush, 1946, chose Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge. 1945, as the first Office of Homeland Security Advisor. Ridge was sworn in on October 8, 2001. The office was elevated to the department level on November 25, 2002, when President Bush signed into law the Homeland Security Act, creating the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and making Ridge a cabinet-level administrator. The DHS consolidated several existing agencies and pledged to carry out new initiatives to the extent possible, protect the nation from further attacks. Agencies and sub-departments within the DHS's purview eventually included the Transportation Security Administration, Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Offices. U.S. Citizenship and Information Services, formerly the Immigration and Naturalization Service. ORINS, an Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, the U.S. Coast Guard. And the U.S. Secret Service. On February 15, 2005, Ridge was succeeded by Michael Chertoff, 1953. A former U.S. Circuit Court judge, Chertoff had also worked as an assistant attorney general, in that position. He helped trace the 9-11 terrorist attacks to the Al-Qaeda network and worked to increase information. Sharing within the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and with state and local officials. How did the Republican Party begin? The Republican Party, one of the two principal political parties of the United States, was founded in 1854 by those opposing the extension of slavery into new territories. The party mustered enough support to elect their candidate in 1860, Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865. During the 1880s party members nicknamed themselves the Grand Old Party. The vestige of this nickname is still around today, as the GOP. There have been 17 Republican presidents. What was the monkey trial? The July 1925 trial of Dayton, Tennessee, public school teacher John T. Scopes, 1900-1970, was dubbed the monkey trial because at issue was Scopes' teaching of evolution in his classroom. Having yielded to religious beliefs in creationism, the story of human origins told in the Bible's book of Genesis. Tennessee state law prohibited teaching public school students about the theories of English naturalist Charles Darwin, 1809-1882. Darwin's scientifically credible work The Origin of Species argued that humans had descended from ape-like creatures. Celebrated attorney Clarence Darrow, 1857-1938, defended Scopes. 
lawyer and former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan, 1860-1925, known as the Great Commoner, argued the prosecution. For 12 days in the summer of 1925, the small town in eastern Tennessee became the site of a showdown between modern scientific thought and traditional fundamentalism. Or as some observed, between cosmopolitan and rural America. Spectators crowded the courtroom, eventually forcing the proceedings to be moved to the courthouse lawn. Journalists issued daily reports, which were published in newspapers across the country. It was headline writers who dubbed the case the monkey trial. Darrow made history when he called Brian himself to the stand, it was a daring move on the defense attorney's part. But since Brian eagerly accepted the summons, the judge allowed the questioning. Darrow first got Brian to agree that every word in the Bible is true. Then he set in to reveal the hazards of such a literal interpretation, asking, for example, how Cain had found himself a wife if he, Adam, Eve, and Abel were the only four people on earth at the time. Darrow succeeded in shaking the prosecutor, who finally admitted that he did not believe earth was made in six days. Brian retaliated by accusing Darrow of insulting the Bible, to which Darrow replied, I am examining you on your fool ideas that no Christian on earth believes. It was drama better than any novelist could write. Darrow lost the case, which was later overturned on a technicality. Scopes had only been charged a $100 fine for violating the state law, which was repealed in 1967. But the trial, preserved in the play and film Inherit the Wind, is still remembered today. Scopes's crime was not sensational, his trial did not break any legal ground. And the defense had not won a brilliant victory, but the proceedings, carried out in the midsummer heat of the American South, epitomized the era and, ultimately, made for a great story. Why was the Dred Scott decision important? The decision in the case of Dred Scott pronounced the Missouri Compromise. 1820, unconstitutional and served to deepen the divide between North and South, helping pave the way for the Civil War, 1861-65. In the mid-1800s Dred Scott, c. 1795-1858, who had been born into slavery in Virginia, tried to claim his freedom on the basis that he had traveled with his owner, a doctor, in Wisconsin and Illinois, where slavery had been prohibited by the Missouri Compromise. By the Compromise, Congress decided to admit Missouri as a slavery state and Maine as a free state, and declared that the territories north of the 36th parallel, present-day Missouri's southern border, were free. With the exception of the state of Missouri. After a lifetime of slavery. Dred Scott sued Missouri for his freedom in April 1846. The case, which hinged on Scott's travels in free territories in the north, went through two trials, the second was granted due to a procedural error in the first. In 1850, at the conclusion of the second trial, 
a Missouri jury ruled Scott a free man based on precedents that indicated residence in a free territory or state resulted in emancipation, regardless of the fact that Missouri itself was a slave state. John F. A. Sanford The lawyer for Scott's owner, immediately appealed the decision before the Missouri Supreme Court. Where a pro-slavery judge reversed the ruling, rescinding Scott's freedom. But the case was not over yet, because Sanford had filed the court papers. Under his own name rather than that of Scott's former owner, the case of Scott v. Sanford, because of a filing error, the case is also rendered as Scott v. Sanford, took an interesting twist. Scott hired a new lawyer who was able to get the case before the federal court. Sanford had moved to New York, and since the appellant, Scott, and the registered defendant, Sanford, were now residents of different states, the case came under federal purview. In 1854 a circuit court in St. Louis again heard Dred Scott's case, but his freedom was again denied. This decision was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which began hearing the case in 1856. In March 1857 the Supreme Court, which had a Southern majority, ruled that Scott's residence in Wisconsin and Illinois did not make him free, that a black, a Negro descended from slaves had no rights as an American citizen and therefore could not bring suit in a federal court. And that Congress never had the authority to ban slavery in the territories. Dred Scott died the following year. How are amendments made to the U? S. Constitution There are two paths that proposed amendments can take to become law. The first path is this, an amendment is proposed in Congress, two-thirds of both houses must then approve it. If they do not, then the proposal ends here if approved in both houses of the U.S. Congress. The proposed amendment is sent to the legislatures, or conventions. Of each state of the Union, three-fourths of all the state legislatures must then approve it. By whatever rules each state legislature uses, once three-fourths of the states approve it, the amendment is made. If three-fourths of the states do not approve it, the amendment fails to become law. The second path is this, the legislatures of two-thirds of the states ask for an amendment to be made to the U.S. Constitution. Congress then calls a convention to propose it. Then the proposed amendment becomes a law when it is ratified by the legislatures in three-fourths of the states. While this path has never been taken, it's an important provision nonetheless since it allows for a popular state-based proposal to be considered. Who were Leopold and Loeb? Nathan Babe Leopold, 1904-1971, and Richard Dickey Loeb, 1905-1936, were privileged, well-educated, even brilliant young men who committed what they believed to be the perfect murder. Both were from well-to-do Chicago families. In May 1924 Loeb, then 18 years old, 
became the youngest graduate of the University of Michigan. He was to go on to postgraduate studies at the University of Chicago. 19-year-old Leopold was a member of Phi Beta Kappa and a law student there. The two became friends, and, as testimony would later reveal, in the fall of 1923 became convinced that they could literally get away with murder that they could plan it, carry it out, and never get caught. On May 21, 1924, the pair carried out their dastardly plan. Their victim was 14-year-old Bobby Franks, son of a millionaire and cousin to Loeb. Franks's body was found, as were a pair of eyeglasses belonging to Leopold. The spectacles were traced to him and he and Loeb, who was part of Leopold's alibi, were grilled by the police. They stuck to their story for exactly one day. Then Loeb, believing Leopold had betrayed him, confessed. They were charged with murder and kidnapping. Under the counsel of noted defense attorney Clarence Darrow, 1857-1938, who had been hired by their families, the pair pled guilty. Reducing what would have otherwise been death sentences to life in prison plus 99 years. In 1936 Loeb was killed by a fellow prison inmate. In 1958 Leopold was freed his sentence had been reduced by Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. In exchange for the inmate's contribution to testing for malaria during World War II, 1939-45. He lived out his life in Puerto Rico, where he married earned a master's degree, performed charitable works, and taught. How many amendments have been made to the U.S. Constitution? There have been 27 amendments to date. The following list gives brief summaries and the year each became part of the U.S. Constitution First Amendment through the Tenth Amendment, 1791 comprise the Bill of Rights. Eleventh Amendment 1798 declares that U.S. federal courts cannot try. Any case brought against a state by a citizen of another state or country. Twelfth Amendment, 1804 revised the presidential and vice presidential. Election rules such that members of the electoral college, called electors, vote for one person as president and for another as vice president. Prior to the passage of this amendment, the electors simply voted for two men. The one receiving more votes became president and the other became vice president. Thirteenth Amendment, 1865 prohibits slavery. Along with amendments 14 and 15, these are sometimes called the Civil War Amendments. 14th Amendment, 1868 Defines U.S. citizenship and gives all citizens equal protection under the law. This amendment made former slave citizens of both the United States and the state where they lived. It further forbade states to deny equal rights to any person. 15th Amendment 
1870 states that the right of U.S. citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. This amendment was meant to extend suffrage to black men. 16th Amendment, 1913 authorizes a federal income tax. 17th Amendment, 1913 provides for the direct election of senators. Before this passed, state legislatures elected senators to represent them. This amendment gave that power to the people of each state. 18th Amendment, 1919 made prohibition legal. In other words, the manufacture and distribution of alcohol became illegal. 19th Amendment, 1920 grants women the right to vote. 20th Amendment, 1933 also called the Lame Duck Amendment. It changed congressional terms of office and the dates of the presidential inauguration. So that newly elected officials take office closer to election time. 21st Amendment, 1933 repealed Amendment 18 to end prohibition. 22nd Amendment, 1951 limits presidential tenure to two terms in office. A president can hold office for no more than 10 years two years as an unelected president. And two terms as an elected president. 23rd Amendment, 1961 grants residents of Washington. D.C., the right to vote in presidential elections. 24th Amendment, 1964 outlaws the poll tax in all federal elections and primaries. Some states had used poll taxes as a way of keeping certain populations of voters from casting their ballots. The practice had served to disenfranchise blacks and poor people. 25th Amendment, 1967 provides for procedures to fill the Vice Presidency and further clarifies presidential succession rules. Upon removal, resignation, or death of the president, the vice president assumes the presidency. If a vice president is removed, resigns, or dies while in office, the president nominates a vice president who takes office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. 26th Amendment, 1971 lowers the voting age for federal and state elections to 18. 27th Amendment 1992 prevents Congress from passing immediate salary increases for itself. It requires that salary changes passed by Congress cannot take effect until after the next congressional election. This amendment had been passed by Congress in 1788 and was then sent to the states for ratification. Since the amendment had no time limit for ratification, it became part of the Constitution in 1992. After Michigan became the 38th state to ratify it, Was Mata Hari really a spy? When Dutch born Margaretha Zell MacLeod, 1876 1917, was arrested in Paris on February 13, 1917, there was scant hard evidence that this woman, known throughout Europe as Mata Hari, was actually a Spy for the Germans during World War I, 1914-18, but
but there was plenty of evidence that she had long consorted with the enemy and had been paid by them, but for exactly what was never discovered. Nevertheless, the testimony heard by the jury over two days in July in a closed Parisian courtroom was enough to convince them that this former exotic dancer, who could count as her lovers a who's who of European men, was, in fact, a spy. She was sentenced to death. At age 18, the result of a matrimonial advertisement. She married a middle-aged colonial captain in the Dutch army, John Rudolph Campbell MacLeod. He was posted to duty on the island of Java, where his young and beautiful wife, now 21 years old, learned not only the Malay language, but native dances as well. Her Javanese friends named her Matahari, meaning the Eye of the Dawn. Upon returning to Holland, Matahari secured a separation from her husband and moved to Paris where she enjoyed a life of excess and soon became known as an exotic Hindu dancer. She performed throughout Europe, all the while engaging in liaisons with powerful and wealthy men. In 1914 she moved to Germany, where she is believed to have been trained as a spy in Antwerp. With World War I on, Matahari returned to Paris. She was permitted to enter France since she owned property there and was a citizen of neutral Holland. She renewed her ties with men of influence and in that capacity collected information for the Germans. The Allied nations kept a close eye on her, and, suspecting her of espionage, set a trap for her. She became a double agent. The French sent her to Spain to work. But there she reportedly met regularly with German intelligence agents. When the Germans ordered her back to Paris, Allied officials having intercepted a German cable for her awaited her return. They arrested Matahari, who was found in possession of a check from the Germans. At her trial, a report compiled by the French and holding Matahari responsible for the deaths of some 50,000 Allied soldiers, was brought into evidence. She was killed by firing squad on October 15, 1917, the war still more than a year from ending. What was the detente? Détente is a relaxation of strained relations, particularly between nations. The détente of the Cold War era began after Premier Nikita Khrushchev. 1894-1971, rose to power in the Soviet Union in 1958 and initiated a plan of peaceful coexistence with the West. During the 1960s the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, entered a phase of improved relations, which saw the signing of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, 1968. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, known as the SALT-1 Treaty, 1972, and the Helsinki Accords. 1975, which pledged increased cooperation between the nations of Eastern and Western Europe. Some historians refer to the detente as the end of the Cold War, while others view it as an intermission. When the Soviet Union under Premier Leonid Brezhnev, 
1906-1982, invaded neighboring Afghanistan in 1979-2. Put down an anti-communist movement there, tensions between the two superpowers, the US and the USSR. Heightened dramatically. Further, Brezhnev had been steadily building up Soviet arms during his tenure. These events brought an end to the détente. Collective control of the communist government The first five-year plan began in 1928, and subsequent plans were carried. Out until 1958, at which time the new Soviet leadership developed a seven-year plan. 1959 to 65, aimed at matching and surpassing American industry. Under Premier Leonid Brezhnev, 1906 to 1982, the five-year plans were reinstated in 1966 and continued until the dissolution of the Soviet Union during 1990 and 1991. Other Communist countries also instituted five-year plans, all with the goal of bringing industry, agriculture, and the distribution of goods and services under government control. What were the five-year plans? These were the plans initiated by Premier Joseph Stalin. 1879 to 1953, of the Soviet Union to speed industrialization of the U. SSR. Why were the Rosenbergs tried? Husband and wife Julius, 1918 to 1953, and Ethel Rosenberg, 1915 to 1953, were tried for conspiracy to commit wartime espionage. Arrested in 1950, the Rosenbergs were charged with passing nuclear weapons data to the Soviets. Enabling the communists to develop and explode their own atomic bomb an event that had been announced to the American public by President Truman on September 23, 1949. As the realization set in that the United States could now be the victim of an atomic attack, the anxieties of the Cold War heightened. What was drive? Mud tried for? A doctor who treated the broken ankle of John Wilkes Booth, 1838-1865, after Booth shot President Abraham Lincoln. On April 14, 1865, he died the next day. Samuel Mudd was later charged as an accomplice in the president's assassination and was charged with treason and conspiracy. He was tried before a military commission and on June 30, 1865, was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Three years later Mudd was pardoned by President Andrew Johnson, 1808-1875. The official reason for the pardon was Mudd's humanitarian efforts to save lives during a prison epidemic. But the case against him had been flimsy at best. 
and history has credited the guilty verdict to overly ambitious politics and a commission bent on retribution. Nevertheless, Mudd's name remained tainted, giving the popular culture the phrase, his name is Mudd. Why is the court-martial of Billy Mitchell famous? The 1925 military trial of William Billy Mitchell, 1879-1936 Made headlines because of the defendant's open and controversial criticism of the U. As military. A U.S. general in World War I, 1914-18, Mitchell returned from the experience. Convinced that the future military strength of the country depended on air power. In fact, he had commanded the American Expeditionary Air Force during the war in Europe and had even proposed to General John Pershing that troops be dropped by parachute behind German lines, Pershing dismissed the idea. The war over, in 1921 Mitchell declared that the first battles of any future war will be air battles. But when the Navy and War Departments failed to develop an air service, Mitchell was outspoken about it, charging the military with incompetence, criminal negligence, and describing the administration as treasonable. Those were fighting words charged with insubordination and conduct of a nature to bring discredit upon the military service. Mitchell's trial began on October 28, 1925. After lengthy hearings, on December 17 of that year Mitchell was found guilty and was suspended without pay from the military for a period of five years. Congress entered the fray, proposing a joint resolution to restore Mitchell's rank. But President Calvin Coolidge, 1872-1933, upheld the court's decision. Mitchell responded by resigning. He returned to civilian life but continued to write and speak about his belief in an air force. He died in 1936 about five years too soon to see his predictions come true. In surprise air raids on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked U.S. military installations in the Philippines and Hawaii. Though the U.S. military rose to the occasion, entering World War II and building an impressive and mighty air fleet, many observers felt the military could have been better prepared to stage that monumental effort had Mitchell's advice been heeded years earlier. What was the controversy about the Guantanamo detainees? After the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. military began holding terror suspects at a detention center at the naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The U.S. Navy has occupied Guantanamo since the Spanish-American War. In 1898, paying an annual lease to Cuba. The White House labeled the detainees enemy combatants. The controversy came when they were not charged with any crimes, yet they continued to be held. The first detainees were transported to Guantanamo, or Camp Gitmo. In January 2002, after being captured in Afghanistan, 
but no charges were made against any detainees until more than two years later. In February 2004, American lawyers challenged the Bush administration policy at Guantanamo, saying that it was a violation of the Due Process Clause of the U.S. Constitution. In January 2005 one district court judge agreed with the prosecution, saying that the Constitution applied to the prisoners. They could not be deprived of their liberty without due process of the law. The Bush administration immediately moved to appeal the ruling. Some in the international community also strongly criticized the U.S. government for holding the suspects. One of Britain's most senior judges called the policy a monstrous failure of justice. In response to the widespread criticism, the U.S. Defense Department considered making major changes to the tribunal set up to prosecute terror suspects at Guantanamo. The changes were to bring the tribunals in line with the judicial standards of U.S. court-martials. But questions also arose about the treatment of the detainees and the methods used in interrogating them. Human rights groups made charges of abuses. In spring 2005 United Nations officials working in the area of war crimes were awaiting a visit to Guantanamo. The holdup was that they requested full access to the facilities and the prison population, conditions Washington was reluctant to allow. According to a February 2005 American Forces Information Service report, there were about 545 people from some 40 countries being held at the Guantanamo Detention Center at that time. The government also held terror suspects, some of them senior members of the terrorist network Al-Qaeda. In Navy brigs in South Carolina, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and on Navy vessels at sea. Who was tried at Nuremberg? Following World War II. 1939 to 45 22 leaders of Nazi Germany were put on trial at Nuremberg's Palace of Justice The International Military Tribunal began the proceedings on November 25, 1945 and they were not concluded Until September 30th of the following year the verdicts were announced on October 1st the site was deliberately selected by the Allies, the now bombed out city of Nuremberg was considered a seat of Nazi power. Though many, including Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, 1979 to 1953, thought that Hitler's henchmen ought only to be tried as a show of justice before they were executed, others Notably U.S. Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson, 1892-1954. Believed due process of law must be observed. The American view prevailed. The tribunal indicted 23 Nazi leaders on four counts. Conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. One of the defendants, Robert Lay, 1890-1945, committed suicide in prison before the trial began. The case against the Nazis was based on a mountain of written evidence, such as orders, reports, manifests, logs, letters, and diaries, the Germans had scrupulously recorded their evil deeds. 
The presentation of the documents was punctuated with live testimony of a German civilian contractor who, out of curiosity, had followed a Nazi detachment to an embankment where several thousand Jewish men, women, and children were shot and buried in a pit, and of a French woman, a survivor of the horrors of Auschwitz. Recollecting a night when children had been hurled into furnaces alive, since the Nazis had run out of fuel. The atrocities were rendered unimaginably horrific by the sheer number of Nazi victims. Which included 3.7 million, of the 5.7 million captured, Soviet troops who died in prison. 4 million Jews who died in extermination camps, and the murder of at least 2 million more Jews elsewhere. The defense was prohibited from employing a you did it, to argument. Which would have been an attempt to justify their actions by claiming it was all part of war. The Allies were determined to bring the Nazis to justice for their appalling and diabolical acts. Among those tried at Nuremberg were Hitler's chief deputy Hermann Goering. 1893-1946, whom a New Yorker correspondent covering the trials described as a brain without a conscience. Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, 1893-1946, and Armaments Minister Albert Speer, 1905-1981. Goering and Ribbentrop were among the five men found guilty on all four counts against them. They were sentenced to hang. Six others were found guilty of crimes against humanity and were all sentenced to hang. A seventh man, Martin Bormann, 1900-45, who had been tried in absentia was also sentenced to hang if he were found to be alive. Seven others were also found guilty on one or two counts and were sentenced to prison terms. Ranging from ten years to life. Three were acquitted on all four counts. Goering escaped his hanging, though he was to be closely monitored by his jailers. He managed to secure a vial of cyanide, which he swallowed a few hours before his scheduled execution. Since Bormann was at large, ten Nazis died in the three gallows that had been constructed in the prison gym of the Palace of Justice. The trials at Nuremberg cemented the principle that wartime leaders are accountable under international law for their crimes and immoralities. How were the southern states brought back into the Union? Even before the Civil War had ended, Washington, D. C. Considered the difficult problem of how to rejoin the seceding states with the North. Some lawmakers felt the southern states should be treated as if they were territories that were gained through war. Others, including both Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, and Andrew Johnson, 1808 to 1875. Reasoned that since secession was illegal, the South belonged and always had to the Union. And therefore the states ought to be brought back into their proper relationship with the federal government. They favored punishing the Southern leaders but not the states themselves. President Abraham Lincoln developed his 10% plan, as soon as 10% of a state's population. 
had taken an oath of loyalty to the United States, the state would be allowed to set up a new government. But Congress opposed it, proclaiming the policy too mild, and responded by passing the Wade Davis Bill. June 1864, making the requirements for statehood more rigid. Instead of Lincoln's 10%, Congress required that a majority of voters in each state would need to swear their loyalty. In an ironclad oath, before statehood could be restored. Further, the bill stipulated that the constitution of each state had to abolish slavery and that Confederate. Military leaders were to be prohibited from holding political office and otherwise disenfranchised. Lincoln opposed the bill and neither signed nor returned it before Congress was dismissed. And so the Wade Davis measure failed to become law. When Lincoln was assassinated the following April, the matter remained unsettled. His successor, President Andrew Johnson, soon put forth a plan to readmit the states. He called for each state constitution to abolish slavery and repudiate the Confederate war debt. Further, a majority of voters in each state needed to vow allegiance to the Union. Once a state had reorganized itself under this plan, Johnson required the state legislature to approve the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery in the United States. When Congress reconvened in December 1865 for the first time since Lincoln's assassination. All former Confederate states except Texas had complied with the President's specifications for statehood. But these new states had also set up black codes, severely restricting the rights of blacks. Further, there was violence against blacks who were the victims of attacks by white Southerners including Members of the newly formed Ku Klux Klan, a secret white organization that spread terror across the South. Congress became determined to fight the readmission of the Southern states by Johnson's lenient standards. And it refused to seat any representatives from the South. The move angered President Johnson. And political volleying between the legislature and the executive office began. Ultimately it was Congress that determined the process by which the southern states were readmitted. By the summer of 1868 the legislatures of seven, of eleven, southern states had approved the 14th Amendment. The remaining four states Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, and Virginia complied with the requirements for statehood by 1870, at which time the Union was restored. And congressional representatives from the South were again welcomed in Washington. In the intervening period, between Congress's rejection of President Johnson's plan for statehood and the ratification of the 14th and 15th Amendments, the South was governed by military administrators who protected people and property and oversaw the reorganization of government in each state. What rights are protected in the Bill of Rights? The first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution are collectively called the Bill of Rights, which became law on December 15, 1791, and are meant to guarantee individual liberties. The First Amendment, which is perhaps most often cited by Americans, 
guarantees freedom of religion, speech, and the press. As well as the right to assemble peaceably and the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear arms. Stating that a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The Third Amendment forbids peacetime quartering of Soldiers in private dwellings without consent of the owner. The Fourth Amendment forbids unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fifth through the Seventh Amendments establish basic standards of jurisprudence. The Fifth, which long ago fell into common usage with the phrase, S slash he's pleading the Fifth. Guarantees that a person will not be compelled to testify against himself. The amendment also ensures that a criminal indictment can only be handed down by a grand jury. 12 to 23 people who determine if a trial is necessary. And prohibits double jeopardy, being prosecuted twice for the same criminal offense. The Sixth Amendment protects the rights of accused persons in criminal cases by Guaranteeing a speedy and fair trial, an impartial jury, and the right to counsel. The Seventh Amendment guarantees trial by jury. The Eighth Amendment prohibits excessive bail, excessive fines, and cruel and unusual punishment. The Ninth Amendment, which is one that many Americans are probably unable to cite, is an important one nevertheless, it states that simply because a right is not enumerated in the Constitution, it does not mean that the people do not retain that right. The Tenth Amendment relinquishes to the state governments those powers the Constitution did not expressly grant the federal government or deny the states. In other words, it limits the power of the federal government to that which is granted in the Constitution. What was trial by ordeal? It was an irrational way of determining someone's guilt or innocence. After the fall of Rome, 476, Roman law gave way to the laws of the various Germanic. Also called barbarian, tribes in Europe. If someone was charged with a crime, he or she was deliberately injured in some way. If the injury, from a heated iron bar or immersion into hot water, for example, healed within a prescribed number of days, usually three, the person was declared innocent. If the wound failed to heal, the verdict was guilty. This method for determining innocence or guilt was also called divination, since the court was trying through the ordeal, to divine, discover intuitively, whether the accused person was guilty. Trial by ordeal gave way to a far more practical, and certainly more rational, form of trial, in which judge and jury presided over the presentation of a case and employed written code or precedent or both to arrive at a verdict. But divination, literally, to predict by supernatural means, was used as recently as the 1600s. When women in Puritan New England were charged with witchcraft, a suspect was bound up with rope and immersed in water. 
If she sank, she was innocent, if she floated, she was declared guilty. The reasoning being that only someone with supernatural power could float under the circumstances. Those found guilty by this form of trial were put to death. Why was Susan B? Anthony tried? Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1896, was tried for violating federal voting laws. The suffrage movement was in full swing in 1872 when Anthony and 14 female companions went to the Rochester, New York, voter registration office and demanded to be registered. When the officials refused, Anthony argued with them, showing them the written opinion of a judge Henry R. Selden, who agreed with her, and others, that the 14th Amendment. 1868 also protects women's rights, including the right to vote. She threatened the registrars that she would sue them. If they did not allow her to participate in elections. They gave in and the women signed up to vote. On election day, November 5th, they did just that. 23 days later, all 15 women were arrested for having done so. Bail was set, and eventually all the women were released. The following June, Anthony's trial got underway. The U.S. District Attorney presented the government's case against her. She had upon the fifth day of November. 1872, voted. At which time she was a woman. She was found guilty and ordered to pay a fine of $100. In another act of civil disobedience. Anthony refused to pay it, saying, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. In the coming years, the nation's courts continued to narrowly interpret the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, to the exclusion of women. Anthony died 24 years before American women were granted suffrage. After the 19th Amendment was made in 1920. How was the Soviet Union formed? The Soviet Union was officially created in 1922 when Russia joined with Ukraine, Belorussia, and the Transcaucasian Federation, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, to form the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, U. SSR. These republics were later joined by nine others, and territories were redrawn so that by 1940, the Union consisted of 15 Soviet Socialist Republics, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarusia, now Belarus, Estonia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyz, now Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldavia, now Moldova, Russia, Tadzhikistan, also spelled Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. Why was the Bill of Rights added to the U? 
S. Constitution The United States Constitution, ratified in 1788, contained few personal guarantees. In fact, initially there was some opposition to the new constitution much of it based on the lack of specific guarantees of individual rights. It was the father of the constitution and future president of the United States James Madison. 1751-1836, then a member of the U.S. House of Representatives who in December 1791 led Congress to adopt the ten constitutional amendments that became known as the Bill of Rights. Most of the rights focus on individual liberties that had been cited in the Declaration of Independence as having been violated by the British. Most of these specific grievances had not been addressed by the Constitution. Therefore, the Bill of Rights was added to cover this ground. What was Al Capone tried for? Notorious American gangster Alphonse Scarface Al Capone 1899-1947 whose crime syndicate terrorized Chicago in the 1920s, was brought to trial for income tax evasion. After Chicago police had been unable to bring Capone to justice for his criminal activities, which included trafficking bootleg liquor, gambling, prostitution, and murder, the Federal Bureau of Investigation determined that the only way to prosecute the crime boss would be through violation of the tax laws. For two and a half weeks in October 1931, the case against Capone was heard in a Chicago courtroom. He was found guilty on five counts of tax evasion, sentenced to 11 years in prison, and charged $50,000 in fines and $30,000 in court costs. While his first jail cell, in Illinois' Cook County Jail, allowed him the luxuries of a private shower. Phone conversations, telegrams, and even visits by other gangsters, including Lucky Luciano and Dutch Schultz. Capone was eventually moved to Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay, where he received no privileges. Released in 1939, Capone lived out his remaining years with his wife and son in Miami Beach, where he was reportedly haunted by imaginary killers. What is common law? It is the system of justice that prevails in Great Britain and the United States, except Louisiana, where the precedents, past decisions, of the courts are used as the basis of the legal system. It is sometimes referred to as customary law since justices consider prevailing practices. Customs, in order to arrive at their decisions. In the U.S. Louisiana is the only state where judges do not rely on precedent or custom to decide private cases they rely on civil law. The letter of the code and are free to disregard the decisions of similar cases. In all other states, the precedents must be considered. The exception of Louisiana to the prevailing system of common law is explained by 
its unique history it was long a French holding and that influence is still felt. In many countries, the justice system is a combination of the civil law handed down by the Romans under Justinian and the common law formulated in England. Private cases, often and confusingly called civil cases, are largely the realm of civil law. In other words, the statutes prevail, whereas criminal cases, in which crimes have been committed against society, are the realm of common law, i.e., decisions are based on precedent. Did all Southern lawmakers leave Washington once the South seceded? All but one, even after the South seceded and the first shot of the war was fired at Fort Sumter. South Carolina, Senator Andrew Johnson, 1808-1875, of Tennessee opted not to leave the Union. The fact that Johnson did not stick with the state he represented may seem a surprising move. But it reveals one of his most fundamental and fiercely held beliefs. He maintained an unswerving trust in the Constitution. Consequently, he viewed secession as not only treasonous but illegal. His decision to remain with the Union proved politically advantageous to Johnson, a Democrat. In 1862 President Abraham Lincoln, 1809-1865, appointed him military governor of Tennessee. When Abraham Lincoln went on to a second term in office, in March 1865, Johnson was his vice president. He had held this job for a scant six weeks when Lincoln was assassinated. April 14, and Johnson assumed the presidency. Who were the know nothings? The Know Nothings were members of AU's political movement during the mid 1800s, Americans who feared the foreign influence of immigrants. There was an influx of new arrivals in the 1840s, banded together. Sometimes in secret societies, in order to uphold what they believed to be the American view. When people who were thought to be members of these groups were asked about their views and activities. The typical response was, I don't know, which gave the movement its name. The Know Nothings worked to elect only Native Americans, U.S. born citizens, to political office. And they advocated the requirement for citizenship be 25 years of residence in the United States. Since many immigrants came from European countries and were Roman Catholics, the Know Nothings also opposed the Catholic Church. In 1843, Know Nothings formed the American Republican Party. By 1854, they had allied themselves with factions within the Whig Party and in the state elections held that year. No nothing swept the vote in Massachusetts and Delaware. Nearly carried New York and Pennsylvania, and pulled substantial votes in the South. The following year, the No Nothings dropped much of their secrecy and became known simply as the American Party. It was the issue of slavery that finally split the party in the national election of 1856. 
and the group dissolved after that. Anti-slavery members of the American Party joined the newly formed Republican Party. Who determines whether a law violates the liberties guaranteed by the Bill of Rights? It is the job of the U. S. Supreme Court to decide whether or not a law impinges upon the liberties listed in or implied by the Bill of Rights, 1791. The difficult task before the Supreme Court justices is in determining what rights are implied. Such questions prompt months of hearings and deliberations before a decision can be reached as to the constitutionality of a contested law. The judicial body makes its determinations based on a majority vote of the nine justices. One chief justice and eight associates. Established as the highest court in the country by Article 3 of the Constitution. The court has ultimate authority in all legal questions that arise pertaining to the Constitution. Called the Court of Last Resorts, the Supreme Court both interprets the acts of Congress, including laws and treaties, and determines the constitutionality of federal and state laws, under the 14th Amendment. The court has upheld that most of the Bill of Rights also applies to state governments. Citizens were encouraged to build bomb shelters, school children participated in air raid drills. Civil defense films, such as How Can I Stay Alive in an Atom Bomb Blast? were screened, and entire towns conducted tests of how residents would respond in the event of an A-bomb. Meantime, the leak of top-secret information from the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, New Mexico was traced to New York City machine shop owner Julius Rosenberg, his wife, and her brother, David Greenglass. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin writes that the short, plump MRS. Rosenberg looked more like one of my friend's mothers than an international spy. Indeed, the case marked the first time American civilians were charged with espionage. And the trial made international headlines. Though the Rosenbergs were only two of many involved in the conspiracy. Theirs was the heaviest of the punishments handed down in the cases against the spy ring. For their betrayal and their refusal to talk, the Rosenbergs were sentenced to death. In issuing the sentence, Judge Irving Kaufman accused the couple of having altered the course of history. The penalty rocked the world, as Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter put it. They were tried for conspiracy and sentenced for treason. They were electrocuted the evening of June 19, 1953, as new. York's Union Square filled with an estimated 10,000 protesters. Citizens were encouraged to build bomb shelters, school children participated in air raid drills. Civil defense films, such as How Can I Stay Alive in an Atom Bomb Blast? Were screened, 
and entire towns conducted tests of how residents would respond in the event of an A-bomb. Meantime, the leak of top-secret information from the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, New Mexico was traced to New York City machine shop owner Julius Rosenberg, his wife, and her brother, David Greenglass. Historian Doris Kearns Goodwin writes that the short, plump MRS. Rosenberg looked more like one of my friend's mothers than an international spy. Indeed, the case marked the first time American civilians were charged with espionage. And the trial made international headlines. Though the Rosenbergs were only two of many involved in the conspiracy. Theirs was the heaviest of the punishments handed down in the cases against the spy ring. For their betrayal and their refusal to talk, the Rosenbergs were sentenced to death. In issuing the sentence, Judge Irving Kaufman accused the couple of having altered the course of history. The penalty rocked the world, as Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter put it. They were tried for conspiracy and sentenced for treason. They were electrocuted the evening of June 19, 1953, as new. York's Union Square filled with an estimated 10,000 protesters. What was the lasting effect of the Clarence Earl Gideon trials? A 51-year-old drifter charged with burglary in Panama City, Florida, Clarence Earl Gideon had two trials. In 1961 and 1963. But it's what happened between the two trials that is important to every American today. What might have been pretty standard fare in the day-to-day -day business of the American justice system? Gideon was charged with robbing a cigarette machine and a jukebox. The Gideon case instead made history when the defendant successfully argued that his constitutional rights had been denied when he was refused an attorney. Though he had a limited education, after a guilty verdict was handed down in his 1961 trial, Gideon knew enough about his rights to petition the Supreme Court, saying that his right to a fair trial, guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment, had been violated. Since he was not able to hire a lawyer to defend himself, the trial had not been fair. The petition, one of thousands the Supreme Court receives each year, somehow rose to the top. The High Court heard Gideon's case and agreed with his conclusion, calling it an obvious truth. And clearly stating that any person hailed into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer, cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel in provided for him. For Gideon, the opinion served to throw out the first trial, for the rest of America. It was assurance that regardless of the crime, a defendant would be guaranteed legal counsel. With the benefit of that counsel, Gideon's case was retried in 1963. He was acquitted on all charges. What was the lasting effect of the Clarence Earl Gideon trials? A 51-year-old drifter charged with burglary in Panama City, Florida, Clarence Earl Gideon had two trials. 
in 1961 and 1963. But it's what happened between the two trials that is important to every American today. What might have been pretty standard fare in the day-to-day -day business of the American justice system? Gideon was charged with robbing a cigarette machine and a jukebox. The Gideon case instead made history when the defendant successfully argued that his constitutional rights had been denied when he was refused an attorney. Though he had a limited education, after a guilty verdict was handed down in his 1961 trial, Gideon knew enough about his rights to petition the Supreme Court, saying that his right to a fair trial, guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment, had been violated. Since he was not able to hire a lawyer to defend himself, the trial had not been fair. The petition, one of thousands the Supreme Court receives each year, somehow rose to the top. The High Court heard Gideon's case and agreed with his conclusion, calling it an obvious truth. And clearly stating that any person hailed into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer, cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel in provided for him. For Gideon, the opinion served to throw out the first trial, for the rest of America. It was assurance that regardless of the crime, a defendant would be guaranteed legal counsel. With the benefit of that counsel, Gideon's case was retried in 1963. He was acquitted on all charges. What is the Miranda warning? Familiar to many Americans from TV police dramas. The Miranda warning is a reading of the arrested person's rights, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court. You have a right to consult with a lawyer, if you cannot afford a lawyer. One will be appointed for you. Reading the defendant his rights became a requirement. After the 1963 trial of Ecobedo Miranda, a Mexican, who was accused of rape. He was found guilty and sentenced to 20 to 30 years imprisonment. But Alvin Moore, Miranda's court-appointed lawyer, had revealed through his questioning of a police officer that the defendant had not been notified of his right to the services of an attorney. The same police officer had taken Miranda's written confession following two hours of interrogation. Moore, convinced that the confession should not have been admissible in court because of the procedural error of not informing the defendant of his rights, appealed the Miranda case all the way to the Supreme Court. On June 13, 1966, the High Court ruled, in a 5-4 decision, that Moore was right. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974, reasserted that prior to any questioning a person must be warned that he has a right to remain silent. That any statement he does make may be used as evidence against him, and that he has the right to, an attorney. Miranda's first trial was thrown out, and in 1967 he again stood trial in Arizona. But the prosecution secured new evidence. The testimonial of his estranged girlfriend that Miranda had confessed to her the rape he was charged with. He was convicted and again sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. 
Released on parole, Miranda died in a bar fight in January 1976. But police officers. The courts and defendants still remember the importance of the case even if they can't recall Miranda's name or crime. Why is the ruling in Roe v. What is the Miranda warning? Familiar to many Americans from TV police dramas. The Miranda warning is a reading of the arrested person's rights, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court. You have a right to consult with a lawyer, if you cannot afford a lawyer. One will be appointed for you. Reading the defendant his rights became a requirement. After the 1963 trial of Ecobedo Miranda, a Mexican, who was accused of rape. He was found guilty and sentenced to 20 to 30 years imprisonment. But Alvin Moore, Miranda's court-appointed lawyer, had revealed through his questioning of a police officer that the defendant had not been notified of his right to the services of an attorney. The same police officer had taken Miranda's written confession following two hours of interrogation. Moore, convinced that the confession should not have been admissible in court because of the procedural error of not informing the defendant of his rights, appealed the Miranda case all the way to the Supreme Court. On June 13, 1966, the High Court ruled, in a 5-4 decision, that Moore was right. Chief Justice Earl Warren, 1891-1974, reasserted that prior to any questioning a person must be warned that he has a right to remain silent. That any statement he does make may be used as evidence against him, and that he has the right to, an attorney. Miranda's first trial was thrown out, and in 1967 he again stood trial in Arizona. But the prosecution secured new evidence. The testimonial of his estranged girlfriend that Miranda had confessed to her the rape he was charged with. He was convicted and again sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. Released on parole, Miranda died in a bar fight in January 1976. But police officers. The courts and defendants still remember the importance of the case even if they can't recall Miranda's name or crime. Why is the ruling in Roe v.